Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. You and I are called to live a victorious life. We need to be people that take our resources and invest them in the locations and for the purposes that are according to your truth. And the greatest asset that we have is the Word of God. That through the Word of God and the fear of the Lord, when you put those together, the outcome is wisdom. A wisdom that overcomes the enemy. A wisdom that demonstrates that you are indeed a God that builds up people, edifying us, that we might display your presence in this world. We are grateful that we have your word. And what we're going to do now is to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter 11. The book of Ecclesiastes and chapter 11. Now, in this chapter, King Solomon he is going to give us insight. When you look at this 11th chapter, you need to always remember where he's going. And that is a transition at the end of this book where he trusts in God and understands that obedience to the word of God is the only thing that does not produce a futile, a life of vanity. And I want to say that again. You and I need to affirm that if we want meaning to our life, I'm not talking about the afterlife. I'm not talking about the privilege by God's grace to enter into the kingdom, either when Messiah returns and gathers us up or when we die. No, I'm talking about while we still remain in this body, flesh and blood, the only thing that gives true significance to our life is when we live in obedience. And it's through a salvation experience that you and I can be transformed into obedience servants. So this is what we're going to see at the conclusion of next week's study when we study Ecclesiastes chapter 12. But this week in chapter 11, we're going to see passages of Scripture, words from King Solomon that challenges us to see if really we are making right, proper, godly decisions. So look with me, as I said, to the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Now, these words are, are relatively simple to understand what he's trying to convey. Now, the wisdom is not for us to understand these words, but the wisdom is the one who is willing to apply them to their life, to walk in obedience to God's truth. So look at verse 1. We read here, Cast your bread upon the face of the waters. Now, when we do that, what's going to happen to that bread? Well, that bread is either going to be eaten by fish or because of the water, it is going to begin to break up and dissolve. And because of that, notice what Solomon says. Once again, he says, Cast your bread upon the face of the waters, for in the abundance of days you will find it, now, in the Scripture, whether we're dealing with Hebrew, the Old Testament, or the New Testament, in the original text, there are no punctuations, there's no periods, there's no question marks. But this verse 
because of other grammatical indicators, it should be understood as a question. And it's a simple one. If someone casts their bread upon the waters after many days, are they going to find it? And the answer is no. So the question is this. When we look at the word bread in the Bible, bread is synonymous not just with food in general, but but more often than not, bread, which has a very special status in Judaism. If you visit Israel and you go by someone's home or go by where the garbage is taken in place, you'll see bread on fences. You'll see bread at different places because according to Jewish tradition, it is forbidden to handle bread in a disrespectful way to just throw it into the garbage because bread biblically relates oftentimes to life. And therefore, we need to treat life with special attention, that we need to give it dignity. And how do we do that? Through the commandments. So King Solomon is asking a question. The question is, if we put our life in some place where it's going to dissolve, where it's going to be consumed, if we take our life, meaning our resources and what we have, and we place it in the wrong location, are we going to find much of our life left over after much time? And of course, the answer is no. So it bids a question. And that question is, what are you doing with your life? with the resources that you have? Are you investing them in a way that is going to be after many days? And many scholars see that term after many days, speaking about at the end of the age. In the end of the age, are you going to find your life? Now, let me give you a very important scripture. We read in the New Covenant that our life, if you are a believer, that your life is hidden in Messiah. And it's only when Messiah comes back at the end of the age, when he is manifested, then our life will be manifested with him. So if you have not cast your bread upon Messiah, if you have not placed your life in his life, then what's going to happen at the end of the age? Well, you're not going to have much to show for the kingdom transition. You are not doing the things that is going to secure you a blessed kingdom experience. Here's the problem. Many people believe, well, because I've accepted the gospel, I'm going to be in the kingdom. That is a true statement. Everyone, not based upon anything we have done, but only based upon what Messiah has done his death on that cross, his shedding of his blood, because of his sufficiency, his work of redemption, it is perfectly, absolutely sufficient to save. Because of that, everyone who receives the gospel by faith will be in the kingdom of God. But don't think that settles everything. Because remember what Messiah said. He speaks in that Sermon on the Mount, And he says, there is going to be those who are great in the kingdom of God and those who are going to be least in the kingdom of God. And we should strive to be those who are great, those who, let me put it another way, those whom God is well pleased with. You don't want to come into the kingdom of God. See, what does the scripture say? Messiah, he speaks about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We are going to, in a little over a week, we are going to talk about in another study, our study of the book of Genesis. When we look at Genesis chapter 19 and part 2, we're going to see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when we think about those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of evilness. We think of wickedness. We think of places that were right for God's consuming wrath. And we're right about that. But did you know that Messiah taught that in that day of judgment, at the end of this age, it is going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than places like Bethsaida 
and Chorazin and Capernaum, Capernaum. Why? Because those three places in the Galilee, Messiah, he did much of his work. There was great messianic revelation in those locations. And because, by and large, those locations rejected him, they did not, with their life, respond, invested in him, in his truth, in the gospel. What happened? Well, he says, it is going to be better, more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than those places. So let me ask you again. Are you casting your life in a proper place? Are you taking what God has given to you, those resources, whatever they might be, whether they're time or talents or, or resources, financial, whatever it might be, are you investing them properly? That in many days, that is at the end of the age, when Messiah returns, all that you have done is going to be found. Because if you cast your bread upon the waters, in many days, are you going to find it? No, you're not. And there's many people who, when Messiah comes, they're not going to find life. They are going to be grieved because they have wasted a life. So let me ask you a question. Are you wasting time? Now, God is gracious. The scripture says he is a restorer of times, but that is for those who truly repent and begin to submit to the instruction of the Holy Spirit based upon the truth of his word. Well, let's move on to, to verse 2. We read here, Give a portion to seven and also to eight. Now, someone would read that that is not trained in Judaism, and they would just be confused by that. What does that mean to you? Give a portion, ten chelek le shiva, gal le shmona. Give a portion to seven, also to eight. Well, here's what it's saying. The number seven, here again, numbers are important in the scripture. If you don't understand the truth about the message of numbers in the Bible, you can't deal with this scripture properly. Now, we have said many times that the number seven relates to holiness or sanctification. Here's an easier way to understand it. It's related to those two things. Seven relates to the purposes of God. So he says here, give a portion. Give your life. The portion that has been given to you. That's what it means here by chilek. The portion that God has given to you, give to the purposes of God. And in doing so, well, what's the next number? It is the number eight. And the number eight is a kingdom number. It is a number of redemption, and there's an important relationship between the number eight and redemption and the number eight and restoration so if you want as we talked about a few minutes ago if you want god to move in your life to bring about a restoration to to give back to you that wasted time to make those days that were wasted to transform them to regain what you lost in the time of the end with what you have that remains you need to realize the requirement to begin to be kingdom-minded for that to happen. So he says, look again, verse, verse 2. Give a portion for seven or to seven and also to eight. For you do not know what will be evil upon the earth. Now, why is that second half there? See, we don't know. The evil. And evil, well, that can be understood as the attacks of the enemy. Those things are that are contrary to God's will. Now, someone hears that and they say, well, that's an attack on the sovereignty of God. No, it's not. We need to realize that God has established this world, laws for this world spiritually and also laws of nature now remember what we talked about when we began this time of worship when we turned to psalm 24 
And we spoke about how God, he established the, the earth. He set it upon the foundations of this earth, upon the seas. And he also laid it upon the, the rivers. So God set things according to his purposes, according to his plans, according to his laws. And therefore, he allows human beings, he allows angels, he allows Hasatan, the Satan, to do certain things up to a point. And in the end, all of these things are going to bring about a kingdom perfection. But those things that were done in disobedience, even though God is free to use them, he is free to get glory from them, that does not mean those who do them are acting in obedience and that they are going to be rewarded for those things. Just because this wonderful, perfect, sovereign, omnipotent God can take whatever and turn it to good, it does not mean that person who did whatever, whatever is wrong, whatever is sinful, that they are going to be, because God turns it into good, that they're going to be rewarded. That is outlandish. No, they're going to be judged. So what the scripture is saying, go back to the second half of verse 2. What we read here is this. Verse 2, part 2. For you do not know what will be the evil upon the earth. So because you don't know what the attacks of the enemy is, you better beware in the midst of God's will. There is, and, and write this down, learn this principle, there is safety in obedience. There is protection when we are in the midst of God's will, when we're living a kingdom life. And that's what the first part of this verse spoke to. When it says, give a portion to seven, seven, the purposes of God, and also to eight, live in a kingdom character. And if so, it prepares us for the future. We don't know what that future is going to be. We don't know the attacks of the enemy, the obstacles that we're going to encounter. But if we prepare properly by investing our life in the things of the purposes of God, the will of God, and in the kingdom of God, God knows what evil's going to be, and he can direct our paths, he can protect us, and he will cause us to be, and I love this expression, I say it often, he will cause us to be more than overcomers. Look now to verse 3. Now, if the clouds, they be filled with, with rain upon the earth, they will empty it out. Now, that's just logical. You say, now, is, is it really required a person like King Solomon, this wise individual, to make a statement like that? If the clouds are full of rain, it's going to empty it out. When the clouds do so, it's going to fall to the earth. That's true. It also says it gets better. And it gets clearer. We also read, and if a tree should fall in the south or in the north, in the place that it falls, the tree, there it will be. Well, that's, that's obvious. Well, what's the purpose of these, these statements? Well, rain is seen biblically as a blessing. And God is going to move in this world, to bless. The question is, are we going to be where the blessing falls? Or, now a tree falling, that is seen in the Hebrew mind as a curse. So this verse that we're looking at speaks of blessing and curse. And in the place that God curses, the curse is going to be. In the place that God blesses, the blessing is going to be. So what is our response? To ask God to bless us, ask God to protect us from the curse? Well, that's not what this word of God is instructing us. What the word of God is instructing us is to be wise enough to go to where the blessings are falling and to move away from where the curses are. We need to have our life 
redirected. We need to be positioned by the illumination of the Holy Spirit where we need to be to be blessed. So there's going to be blessing. There's going to be cursing. But we need to be where the blessings are. And how do we do that? Well, he's going to give us more information so that we can experience such things. Look now to, to verse, verse 4. It says, keeper of the wind. Now, this is the word ruach, and we're going to come across it a couple times. The word ruach can be spirit, and it can also be wind. And oftentimes, it's sometimes difficult to know what she's speaking about. But look here, verse, verse 4. The keeper of the wind does not sow. What he's saying here is when someone pays attention to the wind, and, and that wind is blowing, he doesn't sow. It's not the right time to sow in, in uh, windy times. Why? Well, in that day, how did people sow? They would throw their seeds. And if you're throwing them and it's windy, well, what happens? You don't find the seeds falling in the right place. And it also says in the second part of verse 4, and the one who sees the clouds does not harvest, meaning this. If you go out and you see clouds, meaning we've already saw, clouds are synonymous, this same word where it says, if the clouds be full of rain, so it says here. If you're looking, perceiving, and you see clouds, you're not going to harvest. So there are signs for sowing, and there are signs for harvesting. And there's also signs that say, this is not the time to sow, and this is not the time to harvest. So how do we figure this out? Well, he's going to tell us. And the answer, let me just give you a preview. You need to hear from God. If God is not directing you about the times, you're going to miss out. Let me tell you, naturally, we're going to have bad time in the flesh left to ourselves based upon how we see things with our own human intellect with our own human wisdom because of the knowledge that we find in books and colleges and university and i'm not against those things but if we rely upon them to give us insight to make decisions that is going to be pleasing to god we're going to be sadly mistaken we're going to make poor decisions we find truth in one location, the Scripture. So if we're not utilizing truth in order to be where God wants us to be and in order to find His timing, that's what this is talking about. Two things, being where He wants us to be, that was the previous verse. And now in this verse, verse 4, being sensitive to the proper timing. And He gives examples from a very, very human standpoint from an agricultural point there is times to sow and times to reap and vice versa well in the spiritual domain and by the way everything has spiritual connections there's time to sow and time to reap in the same way that you're dependent upon god to know where to be and how to get there you are also dependent upon him to find the proper timing of your life otherwise what's going to be the outcome the outcome is that you're going to be very frustrated because you're going to rely upon other sources of guidance and direction in your life. And when you do that, well, that is an invitation to be deceived by the enemy. So let's press on. Look now to the next verse, verse, verse 5. Just as you do not know the way of the ruach, whether it's wind or spirit, you can determine that. It says, as bones in a, a womb that is full. So what's he talking about here? Well, you don't understand the ways of either the wind. We don't know when the wind is going to go one way or another. I mean, how many times have you heard the weather forecast that it's going to be a windy day and you get out? Lots of times, they're wrong, and vice versa. See, we don't know and don't control 
and cannot perfectly anticipate the wind. Likewise, we left to ourselves, based upon human intellect, we cannot anticipate how the Spirit is going to move. And therefore, if we're not hearing from God, as it says in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2 and 3, and what do we know about Revelation 2 and 3? Well, in those two chapters, there are seven messages to congregations, congregations that belong to Messiah. And what Messiah says at the end of each of these seven messages, he asks a question. It says, let the person hear who has a spiritual ear. So let me ask you a question. Do you have an ear that's sensitive to the Spirit? If you don't, well, you are going to be in the wrong place. You are going to have poor timing in your life, and you are going to be very frustrated. So here, when we look at verse 5, notice what he says. Just as you do not know the way of the wind or the Spirit, as likewise, the bones which are in her womb, he says, you, know, you don't know them. You can't see those bones now today with ultrasounds. It's a little bit different, but understand the context. How a baby grows, those bones, what takes place in that child coming to its fruition. We, we really don't understand how that happens. So he says, it's the same way. Thus, you do not know the deed of God, that is, God's work. So if we don't know, left to ourselves, what God's up to, the work of God, where he is working and where he's not, if we don't know in and of ourselves, we are in a very futile position. So what is the scripture trying to say to us? We are in need of revelation. We are in need for God to speak to us, for him to guide us, to direct us, to illuminate his purposes, his plans, his decisions in our life. If not, we are going to choose poorly. And that's why so many people are frustrated with life. So many people give up and they pursue things that are deceptions. They pursue things which are counterfeits. They think that these are things that, that God has provided to make them happy, but in the end, they don't. Just like the person who is addicted to drugs, they need more drugs and more drugs and more drugs. The amount just increases and increases until what? They take so much, they overdose and die. And look at the epidemic today of, of what type of drugs? Opioids. I never heard that word until about uh, four or five months ago. And these drugs are, are by and large, if I'm right, I believe they are painkillers. And I think that says so much that people are addicted to painkillers. Not because we're not dealing with this epidemic because there is so much physical pain that people are suffering. No. People, I think it is a sign People are addicted to these drugs because they are hurting. They are hurting spiritually. And they take these things and they don't solve the problem. They just deaden it. They mess the problem. That's what Satan does. He's a counterfeit. He tries to cover that problem, but he does not deal with the problem. Well, what we see in the book of Ecclesiastes, especially next week at the end, is how we can find the real solution, how we can find that guidance, that direction in our life. And it comes from a person who has been saved by God's grace and who allows that, that, that grace to mature him and mature her to walk in obedience. There is a connection between the grace of God and living an obedient life to kingdom truth. So look again at our scripture. It says here, Thusly you do not know the work or the deeds of God, which he will do everything. Now, what does it mean here that he will do everything? Well, once again, if we rely upon the sages of old, when it speaks about 
everything. Speaking about the kingdom of God. What's in the kingdom? Every good and perfect gift. Now, where do we see the biblical uh, uh, rationale for that? Well, in the book of James, where it says every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven. And there is biblically a connection between heaven and the kingdom. Many times in the New Kingdom we, or the New Testament, we talk about the kingdom of heaven. So if we're going to be experiencing the fullness of life, it is through the work of God that his work is done in our life. And here's the key. Not just that he goes to work in our life, but the key is that he goes to work through our life, accomplishing his will. What does that mean? That we understand that we are his vessels in order that he might accomplish things through us. And when we rejoice and when we submit to that and desire that, things are going to be radically different in our life. Well, let's go now to verse 6. In the morning, you sow your seed. And in the evening, do not let your hand rest. Now, what does it mean, don't let your hand rest? It means uh, don't stop. Keep going. Now, in the scripture, we see something. In the daylight is a time for, and we see this so often in the rabbinical literature. If you look, for example, at the, the uh, Shulchan Aruch, it talks about mixing studying with work. And when do we, we do the work? In the daytime. And when do we do the studying? Well, we do so at night with the candle, under candlelight. So we're talking about two things that we're supposed to do. Work physically. That is what we call in Hebrew, parnasah. Working in order to support yourself. Labor, in other words. Now, there's different types of labor. Some work physically with their body. Others work with their minds. Some do so with their mouth, whatever. But it's labor. And then there's that, that study. And the Shulchan Aruch says, also Pirkei Avot, to be more specifically, says that it is wise to mix these two things together. Why? Well, notice what the scripture reveals to us about them. Verse, verse 6, in the morning sow your seed, and in the evening don't take your hand away, meaning don't take your hand away from the book. Why? Because you do not know which of these is going to be prosperous, which is going to produce something. And therefore it says both of them are necessary. Sometime it's that physical labor that God accepts and he turns into a blessing. Sometimes it's the study of his word, being faithful, committed to learn biblical truth, that God uses that in order to bless you. You don't know which one that he's going to use in order to make prosperous. Since two of them, or both of them, ve'im shenam, and the word im, Oftentimes, many Bibles will translate that if, but it is just legitimate, depending upon the context, to translate the word im in Hebrew, aleph mem, mem sofit, to translate it since. Since both of them, since both of them are at one, and what are they? Tovim, both of them are good. So we need to have a balance in our life between study and work. Oftentimes, God teaches us spiritual truth through work, through labor. And oftentimes, through the study of God's word, we learn principles of business, of workmanship. So both of them are as one. They both produce good things. Now, verse 7. Um ha'or. The word matoch is the word sweet. Now, sweet can also be understood as pleasant. So sweet or pleasant is a light. And good for the eyes is to see the sun. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, the seeing the sun, daylight, 
this is a time of opportunity what does messiah say he says as long as i'm in the world yeshua says you know you can do work the daylight but there's coming a time when night is coming and no one is going to be able to work so here when he says in verse 7 please look once more sweet is the light and good for the eyes is to see the sun so it's talking here about good is when there's opportunities so the question is are we we taking advantage of those opportunities are we utilizing the time that god has given to us to serve him why well notice what else is said move now to verse 8 for if the years are many that will that a man will live and all of them he will rejoice so he's giving a situation look again for if the years are many that a man will live and in them he rejoiced and in all of them really is a better way to translate it and if all the years he rejoices it says but he will remember the days of darkness isn't that true i mean we can have years when we look at that year and say you know what that was a good year god was gracious god was blessing god was moving in my life and there was gladness now what happens well there's also going to be with that in that year days of darkness and what happens well it says here the man is going to remember those dark times see we tend sometimes to forget the good and focus on the bad and that is when we have an attitude of negativity when we allow the bad the dark times to color all of our experiences rather than what remembering the good focus on the good you know in judaism there's a very important principle and that is to think good i can tell you you know people sometimes they uh, uh do things and at first glance we go well i'm offended by that or we think that wasn't nice or that that was the wrong thing to do or that was insensitive whatever it might be don't have thoughts like this give always be quick in your mind to give the benefit of the doubt and when you do so when you extend that you know what it's going to do it is going to turn you more into a positive person if someone's late and you you know i bet he didn't go out from his home in time i bet he thinks i wasn't important enough to get there on time he waited to the last minute and all and and that's because he doesn't respect me he doesn't like me he doesn't trust me he doesn't think whatever what are you doing you're sowing negativity about yourself in the situation so think positive thoughts maybe god redirected his way maybe there was something else that happened don't focus on the why take advantage of that time see often times people get so caught up in negativity when opportunities arise they don't see them because they're focusing on the wrong thing so this scripture is very important read further on verse 8 for if many years a man will live and in all of them he rejoices but he will remember the days of darkness for many they will be for all will come to what hevel or futility now that's that word that we see so frequently in the book of kohelet the book of ecclesiastes hevel and it means that which is futile that which is vain and what is he talking about here well you have to understand the context and how the words work with one another see when we rejoice in the good times you know what that is praising god let me ask you 
when someone praises God, focusing on the good things and giving God gratitude for them, is that going to have a good outcome, bring good results or negative results? I think you know the answer to that. And likewise, when we focus in on the, the negativity, the difficult times, the hard times, the dark times, when we allow them, and remember the, the balancing, years of gladness, days of darkness. Well, God's pretty good. And what we find here is this. Notice what he says at the end. He says, all of this will come to nothing. What's he speaking about? Well, he's speaking about those dark times. If we rejoice with God, if we give him gratitude, if we thank him and praise him and adore him and speak of his majesty, if we focus in on thanking him for the good things, all those negative things, those dark times, they are going to come to what? They are going to be absolutely futile against us. Now, futility, where does it come from? You know who plants that? The enemy does. Satan does. Satan loves to see people fret, worry, get downcast, be dejected, be full of despair. Why? Because when you are in that mindset, all your thoughts are to yourself. And when you are thinking of yourself, you know what you're doing? You are waving an invitation for the enemy to come in and increase the sorrow, the sadness, the disappointment, the despairs, the, the defeat. But when you, see, everything that Satan is about is to stop you from worshiping God because he knows the power of praise. Let me ask you a question. What was Satan's job in the kingdom of heaven? And the answer is, he was in charge of praising God. He knew about the power of praise. And because he is an individual, what's his name? Hasatan. What does that mean? It means the adversary, or it's about adversity. The adversary brings adversity into your life. How does he do that? Well, he became this, this Hasatan because he ceased to praise God. And what is he about? That same thing. Turning you into people that are negative, turning you into people that stop praising and thanking God. Look for the good things. Believe the best about people. Because in doing so, you may be sowing seeds of change into their life. So many people feel that their life well, they feel that no one respects them, no one cares about them, everyone is just going their way, and they're just an obstacle to the desires of other people. People are all focusing on self. And when you live differently, when you practice the spirit of the Torah, I like that phrase, when you practice the spirit of the Torah, what is the spirit of the Torah? Via hafta l'reacha kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. And when you love your neighbor and they sense that love, that commitment, you investing in them, you speaking transformation into their life, you know what? Transformation is going to come about. So we read here, don't let the seeds of advers adversity blossom, thrive, grow, and be fruitful in your life. No, realize that when you praise God, all those things, all those attacks and seeds of the enemy are going to come to futility. That's what he says. Well, look now at verse 9. Be glad, young man, in your childhood. Now, we're going to talk about the word youth in a second. But this is the word, yadutecha, which is, comes derived from the word child. So he says, young man, rejoice in your childhood and let him do good. Your heart, let your heart do good in the days of your youth. Now, the word here that's so important is the word heart. 
I say frequently, what does someone do with their heart? They think. So we need to remember what this word, this phrase begins with. It says, Now it begins with, let this one do good. But you need to remember, when we see the word tov, or a formation of that word, as in the case here, what should come into our minds? The will of God. So what this scripture is saying is this. Let your thoughts be good, meaning be in the will of God. For if you do that, notice what it says, in the days of your, and it uses the word for not childhood, but, but young years, your late teenage years. And walk in the ways of your heart, that heart that's focused upon the will of God. And with the sight of your eyes, know that all these God will bring into judgment. So he tells us, realize that everything, every thought and thought leads to actions, right? What does the scripture say? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We could translate it as one thinks in his heart, he is going to perform, he's going to do. His heart is going to produce deeds. And what is the scripture saying? Realize that what you think is going to produce outcomes, and all of those outcomes are going to be what? Judged by God. So, your childhood, you better think properly. You need to set out on a proper foundation. And that's why it's so important for parents to do what we, we, we say each and every week that we're together when we talk about which means and teach diligently your children, your sons, your daughters. Teach them diligently about the word of God. And that is going to lay the foundation for when they are older and they begin to make decisions. They do so with a heart that is established in the will of God. That's what this verse is speaking about. Well, one more verse and we'll wrap up. Look at verse 10. And remove kaas. Now, the word kaas is the word anger. I realize some English Bibles translate it differently. But we need to take the word of God as it's given. So I believe some translations say sorrow or sadness. Not the word. Etzev. It's the word kaas. Remove anger from your heart. Get rid of it. Every time that you are angry, and I know the scripture that says, be angry and do not sin. But this is not talking about a righteous anger. No, this is talking about Anger from a worldly standpoint. See, don't be so emotional about the world when the world rises up against you. I mean, should we be shocked by that? Is that a surprise to you that we have enemies? Did not Messiah say they hated him and they're going to hate you? That they persecuted him, they're going to persecute you. So when we're not being persecuted, when we're not being hated, we should be surprised. So don't have anger in your heart. He says in its commandment, remove anger from your heart and, and pass away the evil from your flesh. Now, what's this word evil? Well, it is a word which means in conflict or the opposite of the will of God. And when, and here's the biblical principle, when I am angry, <laughs> I'm not going to be perceiving God's will. When I'm angry, the outcome's going to be ra, that is, that which is contrary to the will of God. And what did we just learn? We learned in the previous verse that he's going to bring every action that we do under his judgment. So once again, a commandment. Look at verse 10, our last verse. Remove anger from your heart and cause to pass from your flesh evil. For, your, for the childhood and the youth is all what? All heaven. Now, we just said they are foundational. Yes, they are. 
but you know what this scripture is speaking about finishing well see you can be a good little boy a good little girl you can set a trouble when you're young in those teenager years but you know what's really important what does paul say paul says you know the race is not won simply by having a good start no it's the finish that counts well let me speak to those who are maybe a little bit older than i am now we don't know how much time that we have left not too long ago i i checked the newspaper of the town that i went to high school with and what do i checked the obituaries and what's happening is i'm seeing more and more people dying close to my age a little bit younger a little bit older so no one knows how much time that a person has but in just talking in generalities speaking to those who are older do you realize what this scripture and this chapter ends with is an admonition that is a very serious warning that you need to finish well i mean if only you have one day left and it's tomorrow live it for god better yet if you have two live both of them for god if you have a month a year whatever live it in obedience let me tell you i'm going to make you a promise when you live your life for god in submissiveness to the leadership the guidance of the holy spirit in order to manifest your savior your lord messiah Yeshua, there's not going to be one day that you live for him that you're going to regret when you step into the kingdom of god but let me tell you for those days those hours those minutes however little that you don't live for him that you live for self you live under the delusion of this world being blinded by the enemy you are going to live and enter into the kingdom of god with regret i want to close with this one time I was speaking, I said something about, we're going to regret that for all of eternity. And a, a good friend of my, my wife and myself, this person heard this and was really troubled by that. And to be honest and just uh, truthful right now, that probably was an incorrect statement. I mean, what I was saying was, you know, that wrong deed, that outcome, is going to have eternal consequences and we can't we can't avoid that but we need to realize something god is not going to have his people live for eternity with tears about that no god what does the scripture say when we enter into his kingdom that he's going to wipe away every tear and he is going to transform we're going to have knowledge of how we failed those things that did produce eternal consequences that were not according to his will, that we regret. But God, he is forgiving, he is loving, and he, in the only way that he can, is going to remove those things. He is going to dry up our tears, wipe them away. Because when that kingdom, when it begins in its fullness, it is going to be a kingdom of joy, of gladness. And we're going to have eternal praise, eternal thanksgiving for what we are experiencing each and every moment. In reality, time will be no more. We will just have eternity with our Savior, our Lord. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>